Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the algorithm seminar. Uh, today we're very happy to have uh, Fred to give a talk here. Um, he's a fifth year PhD student in the theory group at Berkeley, advised by Jelani Nelson. Uh, he's broadly interested in algorithmic questions in learning and statistics. Uh, and he currently is also entering our group. Um, please welcome our speaker. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, thanks, Jiming, for the nice introduction, and thank you all for being here. Uh, let me get started, and today's topic is on online prediction in sublinear space. And I really enjoy like interactive talks, so at any point, if any comments and uh, questions, definitely feel free to interrupt. Uh, okay, let me just get into it. So the basic setting we're going to consider today is some kind of online forecasting problem. So let me define this informally for now. Uh, the informal setting we can think of is just weather forecasting, where every day at the you know at the beginning we like to predict, let's say for the rest of the day, whether it will be raining or sunny. These are just binary choices you have to make. Of course, in the worst case, this problem may be hard if you know the environment is adversarial. So what's going to help us is that we have access to a set of experts. These are you know the weather for the TV channels, the scientists, and statistical models that you can query, and they will give you recommendations. Our goal, rather than trying to predict without any information, is rather just to try to aggregate all their recommendations and just compete with the best experts. This is something that you're all very familiar with, and turns out that, okay, I'm sure many of you know this is known as the expert learning problem. It's probably the most basic question in sequential decision making. And today we're going to look at this problem from a new perspective, the perspective of space complexity. So we're really trying to look at this problem from perspective of data streaming problem when the algorithm has limited space. What's the motivation of that? Well, the classic algorithm for solving regression minimization in online learning is by the multiple late update method. And this method by itself has to keep track of the, the entire weight distribution of all of the experts. And therefore, you have large number of experts, n of them, the space complexity may be high. And Today, we're going to see a new result that uh, achieves small regret, little OT. And we're going to do this in sublinear memory without using omega n memory. So I think this really opens up this new direction of the intersection of online learning and data streaming algorithm. And towards the end of the talk, I will also highlight some open directions. So here's the um, outline for today. I'm going to define some basic uh, background. And then before getting into the algorithm result, I want to give you a bit more intuition about what's going on. So there will be some a little bit harness uh, uh, proof. And I will tell you a decent fraction of the algorithm and the proof. And I will conclude with some open questions. OK, so first, let me just form formalize this notion of uh, online prediction. So for now, uh, I will define two, two versions. Here's the simple one. In this simple version, I have an unknown sequence of binary numbers over t days. I know t, let's say. And there are n experts. Again, these are the scientists, statistical models, and so on. And at each day, the expert will give me a recommendation that's also uh, a binary number. And after observing all these recommendations, but before observing this actual outcome, this binary outcome, the algorithm must follow one of the experts. and make a decision, and then after observing, the outcome will suffer a loss of value one, if and only if we make a mistake. So there's a classic notion of uh, performance measure for this problem. It's called regret. It's just uh, the total amount of uh, mistake the algorithm made relative to the best experts. You know, I star will always be the best answer for, for the rest of this talk. And a slight generalization of that uh, we'll consider today is online learning problem of its expert advice. There's a slight difference. So the difference is basically there's no sequence to predict, predict anymore. There are still NT days and N experts. But rather, we can think of these experts as arms. And every day, the algorithm is just going to play one of the experts from this one to end this set. At the end of the day, rather than re uh, receiving a binary outcome, we'll just receive a loss vector. So every expert incurs a loss let's say continuously between zero and one. And the algorithm loss is just the loss of the expert and the algorithm played. And same, similarly, we'll measure everything in terms of regret. These are just two small 
like slightly different settings. And the, the only reason I tell you uh, these two, two settings is that all the lower bounds that we're going to see apply to the special case, to the simple setting of pr predicting online numbers, binary numbers. Uh, but the main algorithmic result we, we, we will show apply to the harder problem of online learning. Is there any question about the basic problem setting? There is definitely one crucial aspect I haven't really specified, which is adversary model, how the input is actually generated. There are mostly three variants in the literature at this moment. The most classic one being the non-adaptive model, where the loss vectors at every day is fixed up front. So even before you know the game begins, uh, the adversary just makes a commitment to the loss vectors. The slightly harder setting, or uh, the harder setting, is black box adversary model, where adversary can see the output of the algorithm over time, and potentially they can adapt to the algorithm decisions in the past. But crucially, this is black box because the adversary doesn't gain any access access to the internal states of the algorithm. There is a harder setting in the literature that's called white box adversary where the adversary may even see the internal state, maybe except the randomness, because the problem wouldn't be very interesting if the algorithm is deterministic. So the adversary, in the white box model, the adversary can see the internal state as well as the previous decisions made by the algorithm. Uh, today, the main algorithm result applies to the first simple settings. And this, again, this is the most classic in the literature. And there are follow-ups uh, that tackle the, the, the other two models. And I will mention briefly what they are, uh, what these results are. Okay, so let's get into uh, a bit more about what this problem was solved classically and what you could conceivably solve that. Uh, for the goal of regret minimization, well, the most naive idea that you could try is to always play the expert that achieves uh, minimum historical loss. So this is called follow the leader. To implement that algorithm, you just uh, have a counter for every single expert track their cumulative loss over all these t days. And you always play the one that has the smallest counter. And apparently, this has to give you a, a high memory cost uh, that's proportional to the number of experts. Uh, but it is not good either. Uh, so in terms of regrets, uh, it's, it's not a stable algorithm in some sense. Uh, you, you would basically make a uh, mistake every day. There is something much better I will show you in the next two slides. Um, this includes a multi-phase update algorithm that gets you but basically square root t regret. Um, all these tasks, as far as I know, mostly build upon or refine this idea, follow the leader, and it will see that they don't get very good memory guarantees. That's the main barrier we're going to overcome today. Okay. So I'll just briefly tell you like two schemes of getting this square root t thing. And the most classic one is Markin Vates, where you start with some uniform distribution over all the experts. Track, we'll keep track of that. That's the internal state. Every time we will play the experts proportional to their rate. After observing the loss, LT of i, every day, you update the weight according to this multiple rule. It's a very natural rule where if, let's say, the loss is this one, the weight will be halved. If the loss is zero, the weight is precisely remained. So it's a very natural rule, and we'll just get you the right guarantee. And it turns out what's more interesting about this is that it's equivalent to some variant of follow the leader. It's called follow the regularized leader, where instead of you know finding the you know the naive leader, you will find the leader that minimizes the total historical loss plus some. Uh, entropy, uh, some regularizer. And if you choose this regularizer phi to be the entropy, you precisely recover the multiple weights multiple rule. And that's something you can find in the textbook. So I won't expand this uh, equivalence here. There is another uh, somewhat similar algorithm uh, that solved this problem as well. So this is called follow the perturbed leader. The difference is, again, it's, you will find the leader, you will find uh, the uh, the expert that minimizes historical loss, but plus some noise in, in this case. And for expert problem, you can choose this noise variable uh, epsilon to be exponentially distributed. So it's independent across all the experts. Again, because you have to uh, maintain this counters for the historical loss of all experts, uh, the memory usage is high. It's proportional to the number of experts. And that's the main barrier we're trying to overcome. So the goal today, we'll try to design a uh, little O-N space algorithm with small regret. 
And we see, as we, we saw, you know, all these previous algorithms go through this kind of leader selection subroutine. We'll crack those counters and we'll get around this. That's the main conceptual uh, point of our result. Okay. So let me uh, go over just a very simple hardness result from a previous paper. I think that's uh, something that highlights the intuition of uh, this, uh, this question. So here's a very simple task that you know you can try to solve and i think all the previous algorithm essentially would have to solve that so the goal of this you know uh, leader selection uh, uh problem is just that at the end end of the day t you want to output the best expert obviously all these previous algorithms can solve this task very trivially because they have this counter anyway so this is really a trivial task in a uh, linear space and potentially, you can think, you know, if I have such a routine sublinear space, and can somehow use that for solving regret minimization. And it turns out that there's no such, uh, you know, efficient algorithm in sublinear space uh, regime. So in sublinear regime, you can sublinear space regime, you cannot really identify the best expert at the end of the sequence. And that's the theorem I want to just quickly tell you uh, in the next few slides. Yeah. Is there any, any question about uh, the, the, the main claim? I just want to output the best expert at the end uh, using small space. It turns out that's impossible. Okay. Uh, so the proof, as you can expect, is uh, it's a data streaming problem. So the proof is by communication complexity reduction. A uh, very classic problem called static runness that uses linear number of uh, bits of communication. In this problem, Alice and Bob, two party, would have to communicate to solve some promise problem. Both of them have n binary bits. The goal is to determine whether uh, you know, their binary uh, vectors have zero intersection or have exactly one intersection. So that's a promise. And to di distinguish that, we know that has to pay linear communication call. Here's the reduction. Uh, basically, the reduction will tell you how to solve this set is running problem using some best arm identification procedure. We'll just look at the right-hand side of this slide. So don't read the, the, the text. So what's an instance of a regret minimization problem looks like? Well, it's basically a table, a table where all the rows correspond to experts and all the co columns correspond to this. In this very simple example, I have five for each of them. And let's suppose that in this uh, communication problem of status runness, Alice has a vector 11001. I think of this as a indicator vector for three items. One, two, and three. And the reduction just says, I'm just going to ignore all the off diagonal uh, entries. They are all incorrect. Okay. Whenever I put a cross mark, they mean that expert I is incorrect on DJ. And I will put uh, check marks on diagonal terms corresponding to Alice input. So in this case, expert one is, correspond, uh, is correct on day one, expert two is correct on day two, and so on. And that's precisely what this reduction does. That, that's the entire thing. And it will ask Bob to do exactly the same. And at the end, we'll concatenate these two parts of the input together to make an instance of 10 days in this case. So let's consider a disjoint inputs where Alice has one to five and Bob has three and four. In this case, I have 10 days. But if you just consider, you know, just by the definition of this reduction, all the experts are correct at most once. So the first five days in this picture are precisely what you saw on the last slide. And the next five, five days are what you would generate with Bob's app input. This is a disjoint case. What if I have a non-disjoint case? So there is an intersection between Alice and Bob, in particular, uh, the item one. In this case, I have expert one uh, being the one that's correct twice. And this is the only expert because under the promise that there's only one item that's shared by both of uh, the parties. And that corresponds to the only one expert that's correct twice. And that will be the best expert. That will basically conclude the proof. Essentially, you know, you run this reduction, concatenate there are uh, in two instances. And the only one that can possibly be correct twice is the one that's best expert. And that will be the shared item. And you can run another round of communication to just check. So what's the message? Well, identifying the best expert 
it's really just harder than regret minimization. You cannot solve regret minimization by trying to identify the best R. So this is really some kind of conceptual se separation between the classic regime and the sublinear space regime. Yeah, any question about this proof before I move on to the main algorithm result? Okay. Yeah, let me just tell you the main theorem. So for the rest of the talk, let's think about an asymptotic regime where t goes to infinity. Uh, the only reason is that our main, uh, you know, the, the, the regret bound has some dependence on it, which is not optimal. Um, so here's the main theorem. In this paper, we show that there is an online algorithm and there are non-adaptive adversary that uses n to the delta memory. Delta is the trade-off parameter between zero and one. And this algorithm gets a total regret of t to the two over two plus delta times n squared. So poly, some poly n factor that, uh, in, at least in this paper, we didn't know how to avoid. But let's imagine T is really the large factor, so this is still something sublinear in T. So I, I know this is a little bit uh, tricky to think about. Let me just give you some examples to parse uh, these expressions. So in particular, if you plug in delta equal to 0.99, something close to one, then you will get n to the 0.99 memory. So this is slightly sublinear, okay? And plugging delta basically equal to one to this green bound, you will get T to the two over three times some poly n factor. Okay. So apparently this is not really optimal because this linear memory should get all the way to square root t uh, as multiple weights would do. And well, I will tell you what's the, main, the optimal thing you should expect. And also if you plug in delta equal to 0.5, you will get square root n memory equally. And if you plug in 0.5 to the green bound, you will get t to the four over five. In general, this is a memory versus regret trade-off uh, as an upper bound. So in this plot, I'm plotting, you know, the, the, the delta, the trade-off parameter on the x-axis and the exponent of the regret bound in the y-axis. On the left end, you will have essentially zero memory. Then there's nothing you can do. So regret will be t, t to the one. On the other hand, if you have full memory, you'll get t to the two over t. And as you expect, this is not tight. And it turns out this is very far from tight. Okay? Here's a known lower bound that that's that was later shown to be optimal. By this pre uh, uh, prior work by Serena Venus, uh, Woodrow, Xu, and Zhou, they show the following lower bound. For any algorithm, it's as bits of memory, uh, as is, let's say, between some constant and all the way to n. The regret is at least square root n t or s. What does that mean? If you have s equal to n, obviously this is just the tight bound. This is what multiple ways do. It's square root t, exactly right. If I plug in s equal to square root n, well, I get something like square root t, still square root t, times n to the one fourth. So the dependence on t is always optimal just by observing the form of this bound. And further, even if you have constant memory, this lower bound suggests that it can still get, you know, the optimal uh, regret, at least in the asymptotic regime where you don't care about the dependence on n. Okay. This is, after our work, there is really this tantalizing conjecture that even in constant uh, space, you can solve regret minimization. Okay. And indeed, you know, in a follow up work by my collaborator, Bing Hui and Avia Rubenstein, they show that this square root t regret is always possible, even in constant space. So there is an algorithm precisely matching this previous lower bound up to poly log factors now. And unfortunately, the paper is quite complicated, I would say, but it uses the same framework that it will go through uh, for the next uh, 40 minutes. Uh, and I hope that after my talk, you will be pretty prepared to read their paper. Um, okay, so let me get into the main algorithm and decent fraction of the proof. Uh, but before that, any question about the main result as well as the follow-up works? So uh, I guess I, I just didn't quite get the like difference between adaptive and non-adaptive adversary because the set disjointness thing should work for adaptive as well, right? Uh, right, that part definitely worked for adaptive, but imagine I want to solve regret minimization problem, which doesn't require me to identify the best expert at all. Then there will be difference. I see, okay, thank you. Yeah, so that proof, yes, only applies to a problem of identifying the best expert but it doesn't apply to the general problem we want to solve, which is minimizing regret. Good point. Thank you. Yeah. 
Anything else? Okay, so let me tell you uh, about the main, you know, high level uh, ideas of our algorithm. The main algorithm has two parts. The first part is some baseline algorithm uh, that achieves some small, slightly sublinear regret in a very small amount of memory. So epsilon t regret in one over epsilon squared space. So let's just think about epsilon being something like polylog and polylog t. In this, in this case, regret will be t over some polylog and memory will be polylog. And this will be the main focus of today. And the second part of our uh, algorithm is a uh, width reduction procedure that significantly boosts the regret guarantee of our algorithm without losing too much memory. And we will, in fact, do this recursively to get our final say. I think most of the innovation of our algorithm comes from the first part, and that is going to be what I will mostly spend time on. And turns out this baseline algorithm uh, is a very natural idea. So at a very high level, here's the abstraction. We'll just do some su uh, subsampling. Because you just have small amount of memory, what can you do, right? So you just keep track of a uh, small um, number of experts. And that's what I will call the pool. And we will main maintain a pool that's dynamically changing over time. It has to be dynamically changing because if you just maintain it statically, then there's no hope, right? Because potentially you could just sample a bunch of very bad experts. And after this pool, after I get this pool, but and I hope that this pool is good, then I can just run market weights on this small set of experts. This is it's a perfectly well-defined algorithm now. Okay. And the intuition is basically now I can reduce the problem of regret minimization to try to pool good experts. And it will formalize this notion. Okay. And I will define what's the rule of selecting experts and what's the rule of evicting experts. So here's the base, here's the more formal description of the baseline algorithm. Uh, we'll first break all the key days into epochs. Each epoch has B, length of B. And the algorithm will do some update on the pool uh, epoch by epoch. And within every epoch, uh, the pool is not changed. Initially, we're going to sample an arbitrary pool of one of epsilon squared experts corresponding to our memory constraints. <clears throat> And then throughout every day, we'll just play Markov weights on top of this pool. That's it. And all I need to specify now is just how I select those experts and how I kick them out if necessary. So it turns out that at, every beginning, at the beginning of every epoch, I do something very simple. I just sample one random expert into the pool. And because I have a new set of pool, I just have to reinitialize Markov weights from uniform distribution over, uh, over my current pool. And at the end of the pool, because I have added, I have been adding experts to my pool, then the memory constraint may not be satisfied anymore. So I have to apply some eviction rule to remove experts. And ideally, we want to remove some bad experts. Okay, and, and we'll, we'll formalize this thing. Okay. So here's a naive attempt of uh, removing backlash <coughs> or defining badness. One day, if I attempt to just look at the average loss in the past. Uh, by in the past, I just mean that uh, the, their total loss since their last entries. That's the only thing I can keep track of. I say I evict the worst performing experts in terms of their average loss. And turns out that we don't have a formal proof, but uh, this is a very strong intuition against such you know performance only uh, uh, metric. Here's a counter example that we have in mind. So let's imagine that you have n minus one really bad experts that are green. And these are, these bad experts would be really good just locally on some sub, sub intervals. But overall, their average performance is terrible. And there's one bad expert, oh, sorry, there's one good expert, the red experts, that's just good on average, pretty much on every day. Okay, let's, and all the bad experts are the screen experts that, that I didn't really draw. Okay, I just drew, drew one of them. What would be a bad scenario to have such you know, construction? Oh, well, imagine I have the best expert already in the pool. And then later on, these all bad experts entered. So, and my current pool consists of this best expert and all the bad, uh, this good experts and all the bad experts. And conceivably, you know, at some point, all the bad experts in my pool would simultaneously start their low loss intervals. Okay. At this point, then at least, let's say, for the next few days, 
then these bad experts really perform well, and then their average loss is really, really low. It could be much lower than the best expert. And at least so they think at least this a few days, they will just dominate the best expert. So if I just look at the average loss, the best expert turns out to be the worst in my current pool, and that will be bad. If I kick out the best expert, then by my selection rule, every time I just select one actual random one, so after many number of epochs, I can possibly uh, get my best expert, expert back. And that would be a really bad scenario. Yeah, my sampling rate is just too low. Is there any question about this intuitive idea? So we'll try to uh, save, uh, save us from using some other eviction rule. So is this a formal lower bound or or yeah, this is not a formal lower bound because um I mean you cannot it's hard to formal the formalize the notion of like performance only based metric. But I, as far as I know, as as yeah, the, the later work also doesn't use this kind of thing. You yeah, you will see we need something else to see to, to remove things. So and I think if you don't look at if you only look at average loss, there's no hope. That's the entire conceptual message. Okay, if we think of like the number of experts as being like relatively small, then like the probability of sampling it again is like like something like one over poly n. Yeah, right? exactly. So after n epochs, you will get the best experts back. Okay. Yeah, and we think the next n epochs, you will just have all these bad experts and they're back. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So what's the lesson here? In some sense, uh, our algorithm previous this average based. Uh, average loss based algorithm is really not stable because you know the, all these bad acts were entered and they only perform very well on some small interval on some small uh, number of days. Uh, but our algorithm decides to really you know take that information and evict the best expert. Okay, so we want we want a little bit more stability. So let's just look at uh, the the notion of average loss and, and see what's the hint we can get. All the uh, the average loss is just you know the cumulative loss of this expert divided by the number of days since our most uh, recent entrance. So the age of this expert. So for an old expert, I claim that the average loss is really a stable number because the denominator is just large because they have the, the the age of this expert is really long. Then even if their local performance is bad for let's say a few number of days, their average loss would be uh, unperturbed. But for a young expert, because their denominator is so small, if, if they perform really well, really, really terribly for just a small number of days, their average loss can fluctuate a lot. And that's the thing that we want to do avoid. So the key idea we're going to see is to really respect the senior folks. We want to try to keep some old experts. And this stabilizes the algorithm. So here's the eviction rule um, to really try to keep old experts. So at a high level, we'll run some pairwise tournament between any pair of experts. And this tournament will define some kind of dominance between any pair. And any experts that's dominated will be evicted. So, and we'll run this, uh, yeah, between any pair. Uh, so the, from now, all I need to specify is the notion of dominance. So just to set up some notation, L sub J of I is the average loss of I over J's lifetime. And let's think of I and J are both, you know, experts that are currently in the pool. And I'm going to execute this kind of pairwise tournament at the end of an epoch. And I say that the definition is, I say expert I dominates expert J. If I is older, so in, some, in this sense, I is a better one. I try to, I try to keep expert I. Moreover, expert I over J's lifetime has smaller loss than J. So here's a picture. Um, so the picture is I have two experts. One is the older one. Expert two is younger. And we, which one? In this case, I basically claim that no one, yeah, no one gets dominate, uh, gets dominated, because you know, well, expert one is just the older one, so it can never be dominated by a younger expert. Uh, and then I look at the loss, namely the second condition. In this case, I look at a younger uh, expert and check its loss over its own interval. In this case, the loss of the younger expert is 0.5, uh, 0.4. But over this uh, interval corresponding to expert 2, 
X over one achieves even worse loss. Therefore, X over one doesn't dominate X over two, so I keep them both. So this dominance rule doesn't really apply to this pair. Here's a converse case where I have X over two having loss of 0 0.51. That's slightly low, slightly worse than X over one. Uh, so in this case, you know, both of the condition would pass and therefore expert one dominates expert two. So expert two will be evicted. Okay, that, that's a, that's a rule. I will slightly just re refine this, uh, to say that, okay, th th this slide is exactly the same as before, except for the second condition, I put a plus epsilon on the, on the right hand side. This means that now it's easier for I to dominate J okay, just by doing this plus epsilon for analysis purpose. So the interpretation of this actual epsilon means that now for J to survive, it must be better than, than I now. It cannot be equal. So it must be better than I by this epsilon margin. And so let me just make sure that everyone is on the same page by drawing pictures again. So in this in this picture now, I have two experts. Uh, one, both of them achieve roughly 0.5, except uh, expert two achieve 0.5 minus two epsilon. In this case, you know, expert two is really you know, epsilon better than x over one, so we'll keep them both. For the right hand side picture, you know, I have exactly epsilon, so that's not enough. X over two is not good enough to compete with older old experts, and therefore it's eliminated. So just to recap, you know, I have sp specified this eviction rule, and I will run this between every pair at the end of the epoch. Anything that's dominated is evicted. Is this the same epsilon as the memory epsilon? Ah, it's the same as the memory epsilon, yes. Yeah, so it's, uh, this is not by design that the algorithm will have a small memory because potentially at some epoch, I will not limit anything that's possible, but I will show that in fact, this eviction rule is very effective. We will always keep memory in, in control, but it's just not explicit. So I will first do the memory analysis and then we'll analyze the regret. It's just focusing on the baseline algorithm for now. Okay, here's some key lemma. We'll bound to bound the memories uh, to bound the pool sides by one of epsilon squares. As a PT is the pool at, at time t. Uh, imagine t is a time at the end of an epoch. And I'll call beta i to be the lifetime of i for an expert in the pool. And beta i is basically the number of days since the most recent entrance of i into this pool. And similar, same as before, L sub J of I is the average loss of I over J's lifetime. And here's the main lemma. The lemma claims that after the eviction, if you take any two pair of expert I and J, where I is older, with loss, with all loss of generality, then one of the following must hold. Either I is significantly older than J, so beta I is epsilon older than J, or the loss of I over its own interval, is bigger than the loss of J over its interval by epsilon over two. This, the second condition is additive. This is not intuitive at all, I understand. And I will go over the proof and it will be clear uh, why this is true. And before that, I want to just give you a picture uh, description of this lemma, just so that at least you understand the claim. The claim is that if I look at two experts, I and J, I is older, Either I'm in the picture where the the length of i is just longer by epsilon factor, or the loss of i uh, is worse than j over their respective interval. That's uh, the entire claim. So I, I, if I go from the old experts, either the length reduces or or the loss reduces. Okay. Now let me get into the proof. Uh, actually, the technical proof is in the paper, but I will give you the intuitive proof. Uh, that's just basically one slide. It's very simple. Okay. So the proof just says, if, let's say if the second condition doesn't hold, then the first condition must hold. I want to do that. And so just looking at the, 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 the pictures, so on the left side, I have uh, not, uh, not the second condition doesn't hold. That, that would be the picture that uh, where I have J that has loss error. But the i on its entire sub, sub, sub interval has loss less than l plus epsilon over two. I want to show that the right hand side picture must hold. Let's just collect all the information we know. We know that uh, I'm doing this uh, reasoning after the eviction. Therefore, i and j both survived uh, their comparison. 
So that means that uh, J must be a pretty good expert. In particular, it means that uh, over the J over J's interval, I's laws must be epsilon bigger than J. That's uh, what the invection rule must imply. So it just means that J is pretty good against I on its own interval. But what does the left hand side picture say? The left hand side picture says that well, on this longer interval corresponding to I's own lifetime. Uh, the loss of i is not too bad. These two things are kind of uh, in tension with each other. So if you just compare these two statements, it says that if I look at a longer horizon corresponding to i's lifetime, i manages to catch up. i manages to catch up by a factor of epsilon over 2. Okay, so only difference of these two equations is left-hand side, where the first equation looks, looks at the subinterval corresponding to j. The second inequality looks at uh, the lifetime of ice, entire span, including this red segment. It just means that if I look at slightly longer horizon, you know, I manages to catch up. So it means that the loss of I over this extra red segment must be small. Okay? Otherwise, there's no hope for I to even catch up. But if this rec segment is really tiny, let's say this rec segment only has one day or two days, even if I achieve zero loss on this rec segment, it cannot manage to catch up. This is this average notion. So it needs a decent number of days for this catching up phenomenon to even happen. It means that this rec segment must be long. This actual segment, if this actual segment is long, then I precisely recover the right hand side picture. Is there, is there any question? about this proof. You can formalize this uh, with a little bit of math. It's not difficult. Yeah, the entire point is just collect all the information. And if you look at different horizons, I somehow manage to catch up. And the only way I can do that is by its actual lifetime. So the life, actual lifetime must be long enough. Now, from this lemma, just, just assuming this lemma, uh, you can fairly easily derive the memory, uh, memory bond. So here's a naive argument just for now. Uh, let's order the experts uh, in the pool by their age. Uh, let's say uh, expert Y is oldest, uh, it's older than two and older than three, older than four and so on. And let's consider uh, you know, adjacent pairs. Naively, if we are all, for any adjacent pair, the previous lemma says that I can always, I'm always in one of these two cases. Either I'm in case one where the length reduces, or I'm in case two where the loss reduces. Naively, if I'm always in case one, claim I claim that I'm basically done. Because every time I go from one to two, two to three, uh, the segment always reduces by a factor of one plus epsilon. But the total number of days is t. So this entire re reduction cannot go, go long for more than log t over log one plus epsilon number of times. Therefore, this entire chain cannot be more than log uh, number uh, number of uh, experts. And similarly, for the second case, if I always reduce the loss by epsilon over two, this cannot happen for more than, I say, two over epsilon times. And because the average loss is always bounded between zero and one. That's the assumption that we started with. Of course, there's a general case where you mix these two things between any adjacent pairs. It's, I'm just doing this very naively. Let's do that to the general proof in this next slide. Claim is that the pool size is always bounded by one of epsilon squared. This uses a little bit of combinatorics. It's kind of interesting. I'm going to give you an intuitive proof again, just by a picture. And in this case, we're not just going to consider you know, adjacent pairs, but rather we consider any general pair of i older than j. I will draw a graph or a graph representation of the experts in my pool. In particular, I will draw a green edge from i to j if the length reduces, namely where in the first case. In the, on the other hand, if uh, the loss reduces, I will draw a red edge. The right hand side is an example picture. And this gives you a deck of colors. And I claim that the longest green chain in this deck cannot be more than what I claimed in the last slide. Uh, and this is just because every time I take a step in this green chain, uh, the length reduces, and it cannot go on for too many times. 
That's what I claim in the last slide. On the other hand, the longest thread chain in this uh, DAG cannot go on for more than two over epsilon times for the reason that I just told you last time. Again, so every time I take a step on the red chain, the loss reduces by epsilon. That cannot go on for too long. And geometrically, if you think about the longest green chain as the width of this graph, and the longest red chain as the I don't know, height of this graph, the size of this graph cannot be more than, let's say, product of these two things. And this can be formalized using a little bit of combinatorics, and I will now show you uh, in this slide. And this is uh, something intuitive. And just to finish off the memory analysis, um, and remember that we actually do this eviction rule of, uh, on every subintervals. And we do this pairwise on subintervals. Uh, but yeah, it turns out there is a quadratic blow up from pool size to actual memory usage, uh, just this tech, for this small technical reason. So in, in fact, the, the previous proof I just told you will give you one over epsilon to the four memory. But we have a more refined proof using potential function methods that bound the memory size by one over epsilon rather than one over epsilon squared. That's slightly better, uh, but because I'm using potential function methods, it's completely unintuitive. I didn't tell you what that is uh, for this talk. But if you're interested, you can check out the paper. And if you do this potential function method, you can get uh, what I could. Okay. So yeah, any question about the memory analysis? Okay, let me move on and tell you uh, the regret proof. At a high level, we'll do a simple decomposition. Remember, what's a high level algorithm plan? The algorithm maintains a pool, and we'll just run motivates on this pool. And naturally, there are two kind of regrets when I do this kind of algorithm. The first is what I will call inner regret, where uh, I compare the algorithm performance relative to the best expert in the pool. And in the end, we still want to compare ourselves with the very best expert. And this very best expert may be outside this pool. And therefore, there's an outer ex ex regret where I compare the best expert in the pool, which I call J star, with the best expert overall, which I call I star. And in this picture, imagine this big circle is the set of all experts from 1 to n. The small circle is the pool I maintain. The algorithm is basically as good as J star just by running multiple weights but it could still be pretty far from ISA. And really dealing with this outer regret is the challenge here. Okay. So this to deal with this outer regret really requires us to maintain a set of good experts. So what's the, the analysis plan? Well, first I noticed that the inner regret is easy to control just because I have a DT over B number of epochs and regret on every epoch is controlled by multiple weights. And the rest of the work is really by analyzing the outer regret. Okay. And that's what I'm going to dedicate the next 10 minutes on. Okay. And to analyze the outer regrets, is this through a thought experiment on the best expert I, I saw? And I will emphasize that I'm running this analysis at the end of this uh, the entire game. So this, thought, this is really a thought experiment in the sense that it's really independent of what actually happened in the algorithm. Recall that uh, at the beginning of every epoch, we'll sample one at random expert into the pool. And here's the thought experiment. Let's consider a fixed epoch. The thought experiment asks you to think about the situation when you actually sample the I star into the, uh, into the pool for this epoch. And again, I star may or may not really be the expert that's sampled in this epoch. So, but I can run this thought experiment anyway, right? I'm really just doing this at the end of the game after everything's finished. There are two cases. Either I star would be evicted eventually if it was sampled. And I don't know exactly which point, let's say, but it has to be before the end of the game. And if this happens, I call this particular epoch to be an evict epoch. Evict in the sense that if, if IPOC had been sampled into the pool at the beginning of this epoch, it, it will be evicted. Otherwise, I star would stay forever and I call this epoch a stay epoch. Is there any question about this definition and the salt is really set up? This is very crucial. OK. 
Okay, let's do the proof. So I claim that the evict epochs are really the good epochs. Let's just look at the picture. Don't look at the text for now. What's the picture looks like? Well, I have uh, I have that I in my thought experiment entered this particular epoch as uh, at the beginning, and the evict epoch says that it's evicted at some point. It, and let's say it's after some number of epochs, I saw it's evicted by some expert chain. And let's think about why it has it, it would ever be evicted. Can only because there is some old expert that's already in the pool and its performance is pretty good. Okay, and this expert I call J. So I star would is evicted by some expert J. And because of our eviction rule, as I said, J has to be the older expert. And over this blue segment, this entire uh, lifetime of I star is in this thought experiment, the average loss of J is only slightly worse by epsilon every day. Therefore, it means that within this blue segment, J's loss is only epsilon worse than I star average. And therefore, because I have this J, J in the you know in the pool, the outer regret is bounded by epsilon average. And in that sense, evict, evict epoch are really the good epochs. They are easy to bound. So in total, the outer regret due to such evict epochs are epsilon times T. What about the stay epochs? Stay epochs are really the bad epochs, uh, but turns out that we can bound the number of such stay epochs. Again, let's just look at the picture for now. The picture looks like the following, which is very different from the previous uh, picture, where I have, in my thought experience, I star entered, but it survives all the, all the way to the end. What does that mean for our actual pool? It must mean that there is no good expert J that can possibly compete with I star over this entire blue lifetime. And that's really bad, bad because we're running on this uh, pool of very, very bad experts, potentially very bad experts. But the hope is really that, you know, the number of such stay epochs is small. Okay. Why, why, why is that? Uh, but okay, so, but yeah, the, the hope is that if in one of such stay epochs, I star is actually sampled. In the actual execution of the algorithm, if I star actually gets sampled in such state epoch, it stays forever, then we completely solve the game. And I claim that after a certain number of times, this must happen. Then the, the, we will be done. So well, why is that? Why would that happen? Well, for each state epoch, we'll, we will sample I star with probably one over n. Okay, so roughly after n log n state epochs, I star would actually be sampled and, and we will be done. And for those n over log and actual state epochs, there's nothing we can do. So we'll just bound everything by b. So the conclusion is that after n log n number of state epochs, i star will actually be sampled and we will completely beat this game. We're done. And before that, there's nothing we can do. So we can, we'll just bound everything by, by b, which is the number, the length of the epoch. So to, to just summarize, you know, I have this inner epoch, which I calculated. I have uh, the outer regret due to the evict epoch, which is epsilon on average every day, and the stay epoch, which is b times n log n. And if you just optimize b properly, and there are some other downstream things I'm hiding here, you will get what I claim. And that's the entire, the entire problem. I have basically finished my proof and the algorithm for the baseline. And there are any questions, either for the algorithm or for the proof. So just to un yeah. yeah, one question. Uh, when you evict, you can evict multiple, but you're always adding in one. So why not keep it at the fixed? Uh, why not? Why not sample until you're back to where you want it to be in terms of pool size? Oh uh, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, in fact, for another optimization we did is we will actually sample one over epsilon square or epsilon one over epsilon. Square. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one over epsilon every time. Okay. Instead of one, uh, just for yeah, it's, but the nature of the proof doesn't change if I sample. It. Let me move on to the uh, width reduction part. And I will just tell you a little bit of highlight. I will probably skip one technical slide. So uh, the main idea of doing this width reduction uh, is to 
uh, to, you know, just this classic is to utilize some classic observation in online learning. So now, with, now that we have baseline and we want to sort of boost the regret guarantee. And classically, there is a way of doing that by somehow reducing the width of the problem. And what I mean by width is just the range of the loss. Imagine, you know, the, if the loss, the, the range of loss is between zero and row, for some row smaller than one, rather than between zero and one, then the regret guarantee will just re be reduced proportionally. So let's just, you know, conceptually, I think of uh, when all the loss values are hot, then if you just naively run the same algorithm, then everything's linear, so the, your performance gets hot. Or, I mean, the regret gets hot. And if somehow we can precondition all the experts so that there are loss is between zero and row rather than between zero and one, we are making progress by a factor of row. And eventually we're gonna run this procedure for some logarithmic times to reduce their uh, width from one to some F small epsilon, and we will be done. And the main, the very simple idea we'll do is just create what, what I call meta experts, EI, that's taking the best of I and baseline for every, uh, you know, base expert I. Why do I do that? Uh, yeah, well, I'll tell you why I do that in the next slide. The way I can take the best of two experts, just run, running mocking weights. Okay. So if you can think of running mocking weights as taking the main of two experts up to some small regret gap. And what do I achieve from this kind of creating meta experts? Uh, the claim is that the average loss of EI over some sufficient time is between the, the average loss of the baseline minus epsilon and baseline. Why is that? Well, first, because I'm taking multiple weights, I'm taking the best of these two things. So up to some small gap in the regret of multiple weights, it cannot be worse, this, this, you know, this meta expert cannot be worse than the baseline. Uh, moreover, it cannot be too too uh, too much better just because you know baseline is pretty good against all the other experts. And so, uh, so the conclusion is that by running this kind of taking the best of two things, I have re I have created a set of meta experts I call EIs that have small bit from one to epsilon. And there are some technical details, but if you turns out if you just run this procedure uh, recursively, and um, you will get the the final theorem claim that I had uh, half half an hour ago. So that's basically the entire algorithm. Yeah, is there any question before I jump into the conclusion? This is a little bit handy, maybe there are some technical uh, details in the paper. I think there's also a follow-up paper that simplified what we did here. Okay. Yeah, let me uh, conclude by some open questions. Uh, one really interesting thing that I tried to do a little bit is to extend this for learning in games. Uh, Recall that there's this classic connection between no regret learning and solving game equilibrium. Uh, and in those cases, you can potentially obtain, you know, faster convergence than one over epsilon squared. And in the sublinear space regime, I personally do not know anything that's memory efficient and also achieves a faster rate than one over epsilon squared. I want to highlight that our algorithm doesn't solve this problem automatically because our algorithm only applies to non-adaptive adversary. But when you try to solve games, your, your adversary really adapted. In some sense, you are really playing against yourself to try to find the equilibrium. So adaptivity is an issue here. And if we don't know how to solve that uh, for, uh, for, for like at least uh, game learning problems. And you know, as I said in the beginning, uh, expert learning is the most basic question in online learning. There are more uh, interesting ones, such as reinforcement learning. For those problems, I don't know if there are memory efficient variants. Uh, in addition to the standard regrets, there are also notions, other notions of regret in the uh, in, in this literature, such as swap regret, which is which appears in game theory again, and dynamic regret, which is just a strictly harder notion of regret. And we, I don't know any memory efficient algorithm for solving these notions of regret. 
Uh, finally, the optimal algorithm I told you due to Pong and Rubinstein is a really complicated one. I'm personally very interested in having a simpler optimal algorithm that could potentially be um, uh, be practical. And the final thing is that any none of these uh, apply to the bandwidth setting, where you don't observe this full loss factor, but only the loss of the arm that you played. In this bandwidth setting, uh, there is something simple you can do that achieves slightly sublinear space that I can tell you offline. Uh, but in general, we don't know uh, a general sublinear space trade-off. And that's all I have today. I'm happy to take more questions. Thank you. If there's no questions, I'm just going to exit this meeting. Maybe one very vague question. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think your results are super interesting in theory. I'm wondering, like, um, have you thought at all, like, uh, if the low space setting could be interesting in certain practical settings? Yeah, I think, like, I think reinforcement learning is something interesting. I think that definitely applied, but I don't. I'm not sure learning in games is such a practical thing. Though. Yeah. So I, yeah, I'm I'm sure there are settings that can be more practical. Thanks. I also haven't thought about booting because there is definitely an explicit connection. Um, but if there is something, let me know. Uh, someone is raising their uh, So uh, I have a question. So like, uh, is there any lower bound on the amount of space you need to get sublinear regret? Uh, right, that's the lower bound uh, that I mentioned several, many slides ago from SOC 22. That's the only lower bound, not the only lower bound we know, but basically the tight lower bound for non-adaptive otherwise. And that uh, but is, uh, I mean, so like it's something like a square root t regret, not something like p two d. Let's say uh, one minus epsilon regret. Oh, are, sorry. Are we talking about some other learning game setting? Because for the oh, no, it's I like uh, uh, just in this setting. Let's say suppose that I I want to regret. Let's say t two d one minus epsilon. Like what what is the amount of space you need? Oh yeah, this is yeah. If you just reverse this condition, that will tell you. Does that make sense? So, so right now I'm fixing the memory and tell you what's the regret lower bound. I could also reverse this uh, condition and tell you if I have a target regret would be the memory requirement. Does that answer your question? I mean, this is a general trade-off lower bound. That's it. So yeah, you you could say like. Yeah, if you plug in some S, you will, oh, you mean T to oh, I maybe I. See I mean T to the let's say T to the, uh, zero point nine nine. Oh let's yeah, that, that we no no so it's a, yeah basically you even in constant right you mean even in constant you can achieve that so. This can be achieved. So this can be achieved. You, yes okay yeah unless you care about dependence on n there's no such thing as you said, because of the so, upper bound. Yeah, I don't know if the, uh, if you care about dependence on and what would happen. There's nothing. Yeah, maybe to answer your questions, there's nothing I know. Of. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Nothing else, Rogers. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye.